Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Bennett Myers. Myself and Dr. A.C. Mazzari are the co-directors of the Dent Neurologic Institute Spasticity Clinic, and we're going to be talking today about spasticity. Thanks for taking time away from your lunch to join me and hopefully learn a little bit about this, unfortunately, very common problem that we see every day here at the Dent. So to start off, what is spasticity? Spasticity, in its broadest terms, refers to abnormal muscle contraction that's produced by an injury to the brain and spinal cord. So often it can be confused with muscle spasm. All of us has, have had muscle spasms in our neck, in our back, in our arms or legs. And muscle spasm also refers to kind of some abnormal muscle contraction, but it's, it's fundamentally different from spasticity. And that difference is not always obvious to most people, but to neurologists who are skilled in diagnosing and assessing patients, um, we can usually pick it up quite readily. And as I said, there needs to be some sort of injury to the brain or the spinal cord to produce spasticity, and really any type of injury can do it. So the most common causes of spasticity that we often see are diseases of the central nervous system like multiple sclerosis or brain tumors, cerebral palsy, which are uh, injuries to the brain that occur around the time of birth, uh, traumatic brain injuries, spinal cord injuries, very common causes of spasticity. And so spasticity, it's not really a disease in of itself, it's more of a symptom of a lot of different types of diseases. So that's what spasticity is, and we diagnose it really from taking a history and examining a patient. Most patients who show up at the spasticity clinic have already been diagnosed with whatever's wrong with their central nervous system that's producing the spasticity, although sometimes not, and part of our role as neurologists here at the dent is to diagnose patients who come in with spasticity as to what's the cause of it. But since most patients already know the cause, our focus in the clinic is really focusing on management of the spasticity. And that brings us to the first question of why do you need to manage spasticity? What's the, what's the goal of treatment here? Um, because not all spasticity does need any management. A lot of people with multiple sclerosis say will have weakness in their legs and some spasticity. And the spasticity is actually helpful to them. It helps them keep them upright and it enables them to walk. And if you overtreat the spasticity, you can take someone who's able to walk and now you've treated the spasticity and their legs are too weak and they're not able to walk. And so we always have to be very clear as to what we're trying to accomplish in treating the spasticity. So whenever I see someone who has spasticity, the first question is, do they have it? What's it from? And then the next question is, is it causing problems for them? And what kind of problems may someone have from spasticity that we would want to treat? Well, the first thing that comes to mind is often pain. Spasticity can be quite painful. And so relieving pain could be one of our goals of treatment. Sometimes spasticity is not helpful. It can interfere with function. And we see this an awful lot in the arms and the hands. For example, people have had strokes maybe, and they're not totally paralyzed. There's weakness, but they have some movement, but the muscles become very spastic from the injury to the brain, and that spasticity interferes with function. And so our goal of treatment in that individual may be to improve function. Other people who maybe have more spastic, more severe spasticity, that spasticity can not only be painful, but it can make it harder for people to care for themselves or be cared for if they, if they need assistance. So for example, if someone has severe spasticity of their arm, so their arm is really curled up very tight like this, you can imagine it's hard to get a shirt on and off in that situation. And so one of our goals of treatment in that individual may be to relieve the spasticity just to make it easier for the patient to get dressed or for a caregiver to get the patient dressed. We also will often treat spasticity to prevent contracture formation. So what's a contracture? Contracture is really a scarring down of a joint. And the best example of this is if I were to take my arm and put it in a sling and leave it there for three months, three months later, if I took that sling off, I might not be able to move my arm at all. And why is that? Neurologically, I'm fine. But the problem here is that the joints have stiffened up so severely and scarred down that now they don't move anymore. And so someone who's had any type of injury to the brain or spinal cord with weakness issues and stiffness issues, if they can't move that limb, the joints will eventually uh, tighten up and scar down, and now this can be a painful situation. So we often will treat spasticity with one of our goals of preventing contracture formation. So those are the major causes of spasticity, and those are the goals of treatment. And very often people will come to the spasticity clinic and we assess them, and sure, there's some spasticity there, but if there's not a problem that we can help, we don't treat spasticity for the sake of treating spasticity. 
We want to relieve pain, improve function, make their life better in some way, or prevent contracture formation. And so whenever I talk to a patient with spasticity, one of the things we always talk about is what's our goals of treatment? What do we hope to accomplish? Because again, unless a patient comes back and says, my life is better for you know, X reason, some reason, you know, just relieving spasticity in of itself is not really a, a goal that we would strive for. And so what's our approach to treating spasticity? We've seen a patient, we've taken a history, we've examined them, and we've decided that yes, indeed, there's spasticity, and this spasticity is causing a problem in one of the ways I mentioned. So what's our approach at the spasticity clinic in order to take care of patients and to try to diminish spasticity? A lot of it will depend on how much of the body is involved in the spasticity and how bad is the spasticity. So for example, in someone who maybe has a mild to moderate degree of spasticity, whether it's legs, one arm, one leg, often the first thing we'll try is physical therapy, occupational therapy, stretching, regular exercise, and we'll really see if we can get an adequate handle on the spasticity without resorting to any kind of medication. You know, physical therapy, occupational therapy, exercise, none of these things have any side effects we really need to worry about. And so if we can manage spasticity without any invasive or medication approach, that, that's always our first, our first line really in treatment of spasticity. And when we can be successful in that, great, usually everybody's quite happy. But often that's not enough. Often we need to be more, uh, more interventional. And so the next step will often be medication. And there's a number of medications that we commonly use that can relieve spasticity. And these often work best in people where the spasticity is fairly widespread, or people where the spasticity is not too severe. And we often can have some success with medications, but the trouble we often run into is that most of the medicines that can lessen spasticity will produce side effects. And the big side effect we see is sleepiness with these medications. And so again, if in treating some spasticity, I'm making them semi-comatose, so they're sleeping 20 hours a day, I'm not really doing them any great favors. And so that often is, is our limitation to using medication is that with a high enough dose of a medication, I can relieve an awful lot of spasticity, but if someone's sleeping all the time, I haven't helped them out a whole lot and I haven't improved their quality of life, which is really the whole goal of why I'm treating the spasticity. So medication often has a role, often it's not enough, particularly once someone's spasticity is bad enough that they find their, cell, find their way to the dense spasticity clinic. So what's next on our list? Botulinum toxin injections are very commonly used to treat spasticity. And a lot of people will know botulinum toxin as Botox. Botox is actually a brand name. It's a, the most commonly used form of botulinum toxin in the United States. But there's actually several different brands of botulinum toxin that can be utilized in treating spasticity. And these include Botox, Xeomin, Dysport, or Myoblock are the four forms of botulinum toxin available in the United States that are used in treating spasticity. And they all work really in very similar ways. They all work by blocking communication between a nerve and a muscle. And that has the effect of weakening the muscle, but also relieving spasticity. And so that goes to the main side effect that we can see with botulinum toxin injections, which is weakness. Now, again, it's all a matter of degree here and how much function and what you're trying to accomplish whether the weakness is a problem. So for example, if I have someone who had a stroke and they have a severely spastic and paralyzed arm where they have no use of the arm, I'm not really worried about causing too much weakness there because the person has no use of their arm anyway. But if my goal is to improve function in a limb, maybe I have someone who has a moderate degree of weakness and a moderate degree of spasticity, well now this can be very tricky for me to get the exact right dose of botulinum toxin in the exact correct muscles because I wanna decrease the spasticity without causing too much weakness. And so it can be a fine line and it takes often time to, to sort out what's the right muscles to inject at what dose. And it turns out that everybody is a little bit different in how they respond to the botulinum toxin. So some people will be very sensitive to botulinum toxin. A tiny dose will go a long way in relieving spasticity, but also maybe causing weakness. And other people seem to be more resistant to it. We often see that the bigger the muscle, the stronger the muscle, the higher the dose of botulinum toxin you need. And so if I have, say, an 85-year-old lady who weighs 95 pounds, probably a little bit of botulinum toxin is all I'm going to need. If I happen to have a linebacker who plays for the Buffalo Bills, though, who has a huge, very strong muscles, he's going to need a much higher dose of the botulinum toxin. And so it really takes a lot of uh, experience and knowledge in 
sorting out what's the right dose of botulinum toxin to use. And then it's always a bit of a try and see proposition. We always will start on the lower side of our dosing to minimize side effects, and then we ramp the dose up based on response until we hopefully can achieve the desired, uh, the desired outcome. Now, what are then? Are there any other side effects of botulinum toxin we need to worry about? So, botulinum toxin it's a local treatment, so the vast majority of it will stay right where we put it in the muscles where we inject it, but some of it will spread, and so we do have to take into account of how big is the person that I'm injecting this into. So, if I have, say, a nine-year-old uh, child who has cerebral palsy who weighs 60 pounds. Well, I got to use a much lower dose of botulinum toxin in that person than if I have my Buffalo Bills linebacker who weighs 270 pounds. I can safely inject a much higher amount of botulinum toxin. And so we always take into account the size of the individual and in calculating how much botulinum toxin can we safely use. If you were to inject too much botulinum toxin, again, this is a medicine that causes weakness. Some of it can spread. And so you can affect things like swallowing and even breathing. And so you need to be aware of of the potential risks of any medication, including this one, and to be sure that you're using the proper doses and not using too high of a dose. And so botulinum toxin uh, usually works best if you have something focal. So if you have one arm, one leg, maybe both legs um, is where we see the best results. Now, some people will have much more severe spasticity, say people, some people with cerebral palsy, People who have had spinal cord injuries may have a lot of uh, multiple sclerosis would be another example, may have a lot of spasticity in both of their legs. And it may be in that situation where you just can't safely inject enough botulinum toxin to get adequate control of the spasticity. What do we do in those cases? Well, the next level of treatment and really the strongest treatment we have for spasticity is something called intrathecal baclofen. And that's a bit of a mouthful. What does it mean? So baclofen is a medicine that's used to treat spasticity. It's, a, in, it's available in pill form, and we use it quite commonly in people whose spasticity isn't too bad. But baclofen can actually be given intrathecally. And intrathecal means into the spinal canal. So this is a situation where a pump is implanted, usually into the belly, and it basically looks like a hockey puck, except it's hollow and it's filled with, uh, it's filled with the medicine, the baclofen. A tiny tube will go from the pump and will, be, and will be inserted into the spinal canal so that the baclofen is given directly onto the spinal cord. And by putting the medicine directly where you want it, you can get very good relief of spasticity, especially in the legs. So, that, so baclofen pump works best for someone who has spasticity in the legs, but it often will help the arms somewhat too. The arms, it's a little bit more of a hit or miss proposition. And so for people with the most severe forms of spasticity, it's managed with an intrathecal pump. Now the pump itself is placed by a surgeon. Here in Buffalo, we work with University of Buffalo Neurosurgery, Dr. Riley, who is the surgeon we work with who puts in the pumps. And then at the spasticity clinic at the dent, we'll manage the pumps. And that involves adjusting the amount of baclofen get. And these pro pumps are all programmable. And so you can get more baclofen during the night when we really want people to be able to relax and sleep, maybe less during the day when they're still up and about. The pumps do require a bit of maintenance. They need to be refilled periodically, and that's something that also is done in, as part of the spasticity clinic. Usually every three to four months, uh, the pumps need to be refilled. And then we need to troubleshoot them because these pumps are mechanical devices. There are things that can go wrong with mechanical devices. And so if there's any issue with them not working correctly, we need to be able to assess what's wrong with them and fix the problem. And so that really kind of breaks down the four main treatment approaches for how we deal with spasticity. First, you have your assessment, and then if you're going to treat it, you have your physical approaches, physical therapy, occupational therapy, exercise and stretching. You have your oral medications, which can be helpful but can cause sleepiness. You use botulinum toxin injections or Botox, as it's commonly known, for focal areas of spasticity. And then for the most uh, serious, severe cases of spasticity, we use intrathecal baclofen. And in many patients, we'll use multiple approaches. So some people will have intrathecal baclofen, but maybe they have a particular focal area where they need botulinum toxin as well. And so we'll use all approaches uh, that we need to to get control of spasticity, again, always with the goal of either relieving pain, improving function, and improving quality of life. And so I always find it actually very easy to tell if I'm being successful because I don't need to necessarily examine someone and say, oh, you were a, your spastic was severe before and now it's mild. I just ask the person, have I made your life better in some way? And if I have, then I've been successful. And if I haven't, then I have to 
uh, reassess my approach. So that's kind of what I have for spasticity, but I think we do have a couple questions here. So let's see. Question number one, can vaccinations cause spasticity? So the short answer to that is really, for the most part, no. The longer answer is that it would be a very rare side effect of a vaccination to cause some sort of injury to the brain that would result in spasticity. So remember, at the start of the talk, I, I talked about how spasticity is always caused by an injury to the brain or the spinal cord. And so really the answer to that question is, can vaccinations damage the brain? And it's probably about a one in a million situation where you could get an abnormal inflammatory reaction to a vaccine that could cause a brain injury. So maybe I should have said the answer is yes, but it would be an incredibly rare event. For the vast majority of people with vaccinations, 99% plus, uh, we don't see serious side effects from them. They do have the potential for side effects in rare cases, but it is quite rare. Question number two, what are my thoughts on Flexeril versus Xanaflex versus Baclofen? So these are different medications. Flexeril, also known as cyclobenzaprine, Xanaflex, also known as Tizanidine, and Baclofen are medications, oral medications commonly used to treat spasticity. Um, Flexeril is probably used more as a muscle relaxer. It's not used quite as much for spasticity as Tizanidine or Baclofen. Um, all three medicines, though, are fairly similar in that they have kind of similar side effect profiles. All of them uh, tend to cause sleepiness as a side effect. I think most neurologists would say that Xanaflex and Baclofen are probably a little bit better for spasticity, whereas Flexeril tends to be used more for people with more what we say, myofascial pain, muscle spasm. Um, but all three of them kind of fall in the same general category as far as medicines that can cause sleepiness, can cause dizziness, but for some people can have a therapeutic benefit. And so all three of them uh, often are utilized. Probably Xanaflex and Baclofen though more for spasticity than Flexeril, also known as cyclopranzaprine. So it looks like that's all the questions that we have today. Thank you very, oh, wait, one more, one more question coming through, I'm told. So allergies to anti-inflammatory drugs. So anti-inflammatory drugs, which usually refer to things like ibuprofen, Aleve, Naprosyn, those are usually the anti-inflammatories, um, really not used a whole lot in the treatment of spasticity. I mean, anti-inflammatories are really used more so for pain. And I mean, if someone has spasticity and they have pain as part of it, maybe you would take an anti-inflammatory to try to treat the pain, but they don't have any real role in treating the spasticity itself. So if I had someone with spasticity and they had an allergy to an anti-inflammatory, that really wouldn't be a barrier to me treating that person's spasticity. Okay, so thank you very much for joining me and have a good afternoon and a good weekend.